This is part one of a three-part video series about how sales really work. In this video, we'll show you the techniques that were used to simulate and measure the performance of a real sailboat. Once we have that done in part two, I will show a number of simulations of sails at different points of sail, how the air flows around the sails, how the pressures drive the boat, and what determines boat speed and boat heel. And finally, in part three, we'll look at the forces of the water against the hull, the keel, and the rudder, and how the balance of those forces and those of the sails are optimized to get maximum boat speed or velocity made good. Although the general concepts presented throughout this presentation apply to any sailboat, Keep in mind that any numbers presented, such as forces or angles, are specific to one boat which was simulated, and that's this J32 Tango. J32 is a 32-foot racer cruiser, fairly typical sloop, but small differences in sailboat design make a big difference in the way boats perform. So keep that in mind as you're looking through the presentation you'll see two different kinds of data presented throughout the presentation. Most of the diagrams come from computational fluid dynamics or CFD models, but these models are validated against data captured with a real sailboat. It's worth noting that all of the software used on this project is in the public domain, so there was a zero cost for purchasing software to do this kind of work. CFD models start with a physical model of the object being simulated. In this case, the model of the hull, including the keel and rudder, was combined with a model of the sails that was generated programmatically so that the shape of the sails and the angle to which they were set could be adjusted very precisely. From the point of view of a fluid mechanics model, the materials that the boat's made of don't matter. The model just represents places where the fluid can't go. The solid model is then placed into what amounts to a gigantic simulated box of air, or in the case of a whole model, air and water. You can barely see the sailboat right in the middle of the model. What we do is specify the boundary conditions on the outside of the box, for example, 15 knots of wind at 30 degrees, and then the computer model figures out what the air must be doing within the box in order to flow around the sailboat and satisfy basic laws of motion for every single cell in that modeled box of air. If you were to look down into the center of the model close to the uh, sailboat itself, you'd see that the simulated box of air gets smaller and smaller as you get close to the surfaces. And that's because that's where things are changing the most rapidly. And that's also the part of the model we're most interested in. That's where we calculate the pressures and uh, that drive the sailboat or retard the hull. In a number of the early slides, we'll be looking at two-dimensional slices uh, through the model, and you can imagine that as a slice at about one-third of the way up the sails. We'll be looking down, so you'll see the profile of the jib, the mast, and the mainsail, but you won't see any of the hull in these two-dimensional uh, views of the data. Alright, now a bit about data capture on the real boat. Initially, we tried to collect data by just having a big clipboard and writing down data when the boat seemed to be stable, but this got old in a hurry. So we ended up creating a little data capture system that basically connected a small laptop to the ship's instruments and also to that little um, three-dimensional three accelerometer pictured in the top corner. And so this allowed us to collect the boat speed, heel, wind information, and the three-dimensional um, pitch <coughs> yaw and roll of the sailboat once a second. And it turned out it was necessary to collect many thousands of data points 
just because things are always moving around when you're out there. Here's a picture of the little Linux data capture computer sitting on the companionway um, collecting data while we're underway. And the USB cables were used to connect uh, the computer to the ship's instruments and the other sources of data. One of the most important pieces of calibration data was to understand the relationship between forward force and the speed the boat makes. And this was measured very directly by using a powered towboat and we put a 500 pound scale in line with the tow rope and then measured the amount of force needed to propel the boat at a number of different speeds. Here's a plot of the relationship between forward force on the horizontal axis and boat speed on the vertical axis. And you can see it doesn't take very much force to get the boat moving a few knots but then the amount of force to go faster increases rapidly. Mathematically, this is a squared law relationship. You'll notice that there's a kink in the curve at just above seven knots, and that's um, commonly called the hull speed. So above that speed, the forces go up even more rapidly because of the dynamics of creating a wake. Boat heel is also very important to us, and so used a similar direct method of measuring the relationship between torque and boat heel by using buckets of water at a known distance from the boat center line. The full stability curve for the boat is shown on the right, but in this application we're really only interested in the leftmost part of the curve with heel angles of 40 degrees or less. Here's an example of validating the CFD models using boat data. The plot shows boat speed versus apparent wind angle for a close hauled sail configuration. Each of the dots represents a different set of at least 60 data points taken on different days with different um, conditions. There's a lot of scatter. Those error bars are just one standard deviation. So that's just 66% of the data um, between those bands. You imagine doubling or tripling that to uh, see the scatter of all the data with just within 60 seconds. Nevertheless, the yellow line, which is the model prediction, pretty much falls in the middle of the um, observed data. So that's a pretty good validation. Here's a similar comparison where, in this case, we're comparing boat speed to apparent wind speed, um, again in a close hauled configuration. Again, there's a lot of scatter in the real boat data, but in general the CFD model seems to come pretty much down the middle of the data. And similar comparisons at other points of sale um, show pretty much the same relationship. Within the accuracy to which we can measure it with the boat's instruments, the CFD model seems to predict the boat speed and the boat heel pretty well. A couple of basic concepts before we get into the simulations. One thing to keep in mind is, is air is pretty dumb. It, it always flows from high to low pressure. And it's really the brilliance of our sailboat's design that takes advantage of this simple property to drive the boat forward. Another thing that, that you'll see frequently in the simulations is that your boat affects the air um, far away from the sailboat in all directions, including upwind of the boat. And this has some surprising effects on um, the way we sail, particularly upwind. The pressure differences across your sail are pretty small, but of course your sails are pretty big, and so it adds up to a lot of force. With this sailboat in 20 knots of wind, it's easy to get the force on the sails to over 2,000 pounds. And so that's the weight of a pretty good car. Imagine suspending a Honda from about your first spreader. That's the kind of force your uh, rig is sustaining when it's um, in a solid breeze. So the forces end up being substantial. Another fact of life with sails is that the forces on the sails are completely determined by the parent wind and not the true wind that you would measure if you were stationary on the ground somewhere nearby.
And it really doesn't matter what combination of the wind, the current, the boat speed add up. Whatever the apparent wind is, that's what drives your sails. So in almost all of the data you see here, wind will be expressed uh, in terms of uh, apparent wind, not true wind. Um, something I'll, I'll not spend a lot of time on is the, the wind shear in these simulations assumes a very flat water condition, not a lot of waves. And in fact, that's a, a uh, basic assumption throughout the data for both the boat model and the data. Here's a little refresher on the difference between true wind and apparent wind. All these cases assume the boat is going uh, one half the apparent wind speed, just to keep things simple. So in the leftmost example, somebody on shore would see the blue condition, the boat going 45 degrees to the true wind. But if you're on the boat, you see an apparent wind angle of 30 degrees. And although the true wind speed measured on shore would be 10 knots, the people on the boat see 14 knots because you're going into the wind. If your path relative to the shoreline is um, directly at 90 degrees to the wind, somebody on shore would say you're going across the wind, but you would see a close reach and slightly elevated wind speed. Similarly, if you're on a beam reach, you're actually going downwind, but the apparent wind angle is shifted and you see yourself um, basically with the wind straight across the beam, even though your path to somebody on shore is going downwind. And if, of course, if you're heading straight downwind, the, the two wind angles line up, but you see, in this case, one half of the true wind speed because you're moving with the wind. One other convention used in this presentation is that when we refer to the angle of the sail, we're referring to the foot of the sail relative to the center line of the boat. Of course, sails aren't rigid, so if you sheet the main sail right down the center line, the majority of the sail will, of course, bend to windward. And you'll see that in uh, particularly the 2D simulations. So this concludes the introductory part of the video. Uh, the next uh, video will start with the description of how the sales actually work.